advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, ICANN 67, Insights from the Virtual Meeting. My name is Annie Tripoletti, and I will be your moderator. Joining us today is Gretchen Olive. Gretchen is the Director of Policy and Global Domain Name Services for CSC. For nearly two decades, Gretchen has helped Global 2000 companies devise global domain name, trademark, and online brand protection strategies and is a leading authority on the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And with that, let's welcome Gretchen. Thanks, Annie. And yes, as usual, as you said, we have a lot to cover today. So just a brief um, look at the agenda. We'll do our usual ICANN overview. Um, some key policy updates, a lot going on, um, especially with the EPDP, so we'll get through that. Rights Protection Mechanism PDP and the Subsequent Procedures PDP. Um, all those policy development processes are, uh, have uh, updates. We'll also talk about the .org registry acquisition that's been in all the uh, kind of industry blogs and certainly was a big hot topic of uh, discussion at the ICANN meeting. And then also just review some of the GAC's key issues of concern because it's always important to track those. So for those of you who are new to our webinar series, and I do see a few new names on our registration list today, um, I always like to go over this kind of organization chart about ICANN. You'll hear a lot in any kind of blog or even in this webinar series, you hear the reference of the ICANN community. And a lot of times people are like, well, who's that? Who's the ICANN community? Well, the ICANN community is kind of what exists on this um, organizational chart. So ICANN itself has um, you know, staff, a president, a CEO. There's also a board of directors. And then you see some blue and gray boxes below. Um, these are largely volunteer groups um, that make up the ICANN community. Each group is sort of has many different components to it. The ones that we really focus on um, are the GNSO as well as um, in the gray boxes the governmental advisory committee. So the GNSO is really made up of what they call the, uh, the contracted parties and the non-contracted parties. Um, and when you talk about contracted parties, you're talking about people like registries and registrars. When you talk about non-contracted parties, you're talking about groups like intellectual property um, interests, business constituency, those types of groups. Um, so there, that GNSO, the generic name supporting organization, is really kind of a hotbed for different policy work, and that's a lot what we focus on in this series. In the gray boxes, the, the darkest gray box, you'll see the Governmental Advisory Committee. This committee is a, um, an organization, sort of a group of people. Um, they're usually delegates from different country, like telecom ministries, and they are charged with advising the ICANN board on different policies that come up through this kind of multi-stakeholder policy um, process. It's a you know, consensus policy organization. And so as the policies kind of bubble up, the Governmental Advisory Committee is charged with giving the ICANN board um, advice. And so they're looking at it from a public policy standpoint, looking at what things might be um, either adverse to public policy interests or maybe have not been fully fleshed out. So those two groups are typically um, uh, working sometimes at odds, sometimes uh, they, they will kind of align, but um, those are the two groups that we spend a lot of time talking about in this webinar series. So in terms of how ICANN meetings are kind of scheduled and structured, there are three public meetings per year. Um, they call them, ironically, Meeting A, Meeting B, and Meeting C. Um, meeting A usually occurs in the March time frame. It's a six-day format, and it's really intended to be a community forum. Um, this is very similar to kind of the ICANN meetings that have happened in years past. Um, this new structure is something that really went into effect about uh, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. Um, but the six-day format community forum is really kind of a full-fledged ICANN meeting and where a lot of policy work um, gets discussed and, and um, talked about. 
So one of the interesting things to notice, you know, as we kind of dive into the substantive material here for ICANN 67 is ICANN 67, this is the first time that the entire meeting was remote. Um, every participant was remote. They've always had kind of remote participation where you could log in um, to like a web meeting room and, or call in and, and listen and even participate in the calls um, or the discussion at the ICANN meeting. But there's never been a completely virtual meeting, and that uh, was the case this time. For obvious reasons, the uh, uh, coronavirus has um, certainly caused uh, you know people not to travel, and, and justifiably so. So it was interesting to do a lot of this policy discussion kind of with all remote participants. But we did, so uh, that's uh, it's definitely an accomplishment. It's uh, something that I think um, we may have to do at least one more time, and hopefully we get better at it. So let's jump in to um, talk about kind of the first topic, which is the EPDP. So the um, EPDP stands for Exp Expedited Policy Development Process. Um, and this is related to registration data, or a lot of people will call it like who is. Um, the GDPR, which was enacted in May of 2018, really was in direct contrast with um, ICANN's who is policies. And so this kind of triggered uh, a need to go through sort of a an expedited policy development process for the first time in sort of ICANN's history to try to kind of reconcile um, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, with ICANN's who is policies. Um, this has been quite a task. Um, initially, the 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 policy was supposed to be all done in you know policy work at least not the implementation work was supposed to be all done in one year um well that that hasn't happened but let's let's talk about how uh, how it has gone and where we are today So with this um, EPDP, uh, there was a temporary specification that ICANN issued uh, when it did initiate this process, which it thought it was going to take a year to complete, but it issued a temporary specification to sort of um, significantly redact the who is contact data, not the, the domain data, meaning not like the name and who the registrar is and you know when it was renewed. Um, or you know, when it's you know was registered or when it expires, that's kind of the domain data. We're talking about the contact data, the registrant, admin, technical, billing, contact information. And so this, the temporary specification initially went into place in you know at late May of 2018. It had very significant and continues to have very significant brand protection and so kind of security and fraud investigation impact. Um, because this temporary specification has needed to stay in place because while there was some policy work that was completed by um, 2019, May of 2019, um, not all of it. And as you can see in this slide, really what happened is that the EPDP team needed to divide the work into two phases. Phase one was sort of regarding the collection and handling of who is contact data and requests for who is data. And then phase two was about access to that data um, so that that's kind of how the work was divided. The phase one policy work, or for the most part policy work, was completed by the deadline um, in May of 2019. But with everything in the ICANN world, um, the policy work is just the beginning. There is a whole lot of implementation work that then needs to be done after a policy is agreed to. So we'll talk a bit, a bit about that in a few minutes. So where are we on the EPDP phase one status right now? So they did issue a final report, like I said, in time for the deadline. It was actually issued in February 2019. There was a public comment period, and the board um, approved it. There were a couple of recommendations that they wanted some further work done on, but um, an implementation team was kind of spun up um, to start working through how to implement the policy. Um, this team's goal was to produce a plan um, to to meet the what they were calling the policy effective date of February 29, 2020. That has not happened, and and I think there's a lot of good reasons for that. I think the policy recommendations are pretty high level, 
Um, there's there's a fair amount of implementation work. There's a fair amount of change here. Um, but it definitely is taking much longer than um, I think even people who thought that, that 20, uh, February 29th, 2020 date was pretty ambitious. It's looking like it's actually going to be much beyond that. But, again, we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, in October, in fact, this um, the, the Phase 1 implementation review team um, sent a note to the GNSO Council. We talked about that, the generic name supporting organization at the top of the um, the webinar, and basically said, you know, we're we're running late. And the board, um, you know, heard that message, but the ICANN CEO also um, sent a letter to the, the Governmental Advisory Council, the GAC, um, telling them that the timeline is going to be longer, um, and recommended that the IRT be able to continue its work and to keep everybody informed. Um, this is a, this has been a big challenge because the GAC has really been pushing ICANN to get this work done, and for very good reason. Um, the who is going dark? You know, effectively, they're really being very, very limited um, access with very unclear guidelines for access of the non-public data has caused very significant challenges regarding um, kind of brand protection efforts. Um, online fraud, DNS abuse, that type of thing, which is just only increasing, um, which is, you know, compounding the problem. So what is that work that the EPDP um, Phase 1 group still needs to do? You know, why is it that they need this extension? Well, this chart kind of says it all. Um, these are the kind of different tracks of things that need to get done. So uh, what's what's... I think particularly um, interesting and also complicating about this, these different work streams that need to be addressed is that a lot of this work is not just in the lap of the EPDP Phase 1 group. There's some work that needs to be done by the generic name supporting organization um, or the council, and um, there's also work that needs to be done by ICANN staff, then that has to kind of come back to this this working group, um, this PDP group, and then they have to give input. So there's there's a fair amount of substantive work and a fair amount of back and forth that's going to need to happen. And I'm kind of going to try to illustrate this by looking um, kind of down that gray work stream um, where we're looking at the different studies and things that need to get done. I think that will help everybody understand that we're probably a ways away from having just the phase one policies implemented. So the, the gray boxes were about kind of studies that needed to get done. And so one of them is um, data retention. And that was in recommendation. There were 29 recommendations um, that the EPDP um, phase one policy group kind of produced. Those 29 recommendations. Recommendation 15.1 was around data retention. And so in order for this phase one implementation team to kind of inform the phase two policy group, um, the EPP team uh, recommends that ICANN, the organization, um, as sort of a matter of urgency, undertakes a review of all its active processes and procedures um, around data retention. And that is no small task. Um, so there was a report issued on that in November. And then if you look at recommendation 15.4, they also recommend that they look at um, the different data um, retention waiver procedures um, to basically improve efficiency, et cetera. A lot of those waiver pr um, procedures were put in place before the GDPR and then were actually a little further enhanced as we drew closer to the GDPR implementation date. Um, but that also, there's a report on that that was issued just in, in this January. So you can kind of see the very substantive work that needs to get done for every kind of piece of this. And we'll, we'll just continue to kind of show a few more. This is probably one of my favorite ones because this has been something that I think has just been a huge, huge challenge in um, kind of the implementation of um, the GDPR as it relates to who is. So this concept of legal versus natural persons, it comes up in a lot of policy work, but it is so critical and so central 
um, to the GDPR because the GDPR really relates to personal data. And obviously there are many organizations or companies or legal entities that register domain names. Unfortunately, um, the, the who is policy, um, the temporary specification at this point, does not kind of really distinguish between legal and natural persons. And so that's a big challenge. So here in Recommendation 17 that was in the initial policy group's um, recommendations, this EDPDP team recommends that basically I can undertake a study um, which looks at um, several different issues, things like feasibility and cost, things like different industries and organizations that kind of can differentiate um, between you know, legal and natural persons, privacy risks and other potential risks. So, you know, this is an issue particularly that's very, very central, but they need some additional input on this. This is not something that this, this team can really decide on its own or come up um, with uh, kind of final recommendations on its own so that they can get to implementation. They really need input from ICANN on this. And then potentially the whopper of them all. Um, this is a, regarding impact to existing policies. For those of you who have been on this webinar series before, especially the last couple, you've probably heard me talk about this, where a lot of the things that are going to be changed regarding registration data don't only have impact on sort of the displaying and access to who is. It has impact on a whole lot of other processes and policies within the ICANN world. So really, um, you know, there needs to be kind of a very detailed review of that. And so they've kind of broken it up into that review into kind of what they're calling two waves, um, wave one and wave two. So wave one, um, the report was issued in January and includes kind of a listing and kind of bucketing of the different consensus policies that ICANN currently has in effect. And then Wave 2 report, which is currently underway, it'll cover sort of the non-policy procedures, things like data escrow and trademark clearinghouse. So there's a lot, this is just identification. This isn't solving those, you know, changing those policy um, processes or, or um, you know, policies themselves, that would be something that would have to go back to the GNSO and they would need to spin up um, different groups to work on that, different PDPs to work on that. So again, you can kind of see how this work is um, pretty detailed, pretty intense, and pretty time consuming. I thought it'd be helpful to kind of show you a chart, you know, the chart that came out of the report of the different um, policies and kind of they bucketed them into the high impact, medium impact, low impact. But I think, you know, without even diving into the details of this chart, you can really see that, you know, there's a lot of work here um, that, that could take, you know, other groups potentially a long time. The hope is that this doesn't, you know, turn into a 10-year policy development process. Um, but it's not, you know, a year's effort which was initially contemplated, and I think that's pretty clear at this point. And lastly, just to kind of show some of the work that needs to be done outside of sort of just ICANN org is regards to um, recommendations 19 and 20, data protection um, agreements. That these two recommendations in the, the EPDP phase one policy teams um, uh, final report really touched upon, um, you know, the the agreements that are going to be necessary with um, the contractual parties as well as with um, data protection authorities. So, you know, right now um, ICANN and a bunch of the contracted parties, that's registries and registrars, are working together to kind of complete this um, work. Um, they have documented the data processing required under the ICANN agreement and its policies. It's kind of like who does what, where, why. Um, and then in terms of a next step, we're, to, um, we're looking at continuing the discussion, really, and to get to a draft agreement of recommendation um, specifics. So there's just, just a ton of work here. Uh, I know I keep on belaboring the point, but I think it's just 
really important that um, people understand what's kind of going on, the work that the level of work that's required, and that um, this is what's taking the time. Uh, it's truly, truly unfortunate. Um, I, I work with in CSC, you know, as a, you know, all my colleagues at CSC work with clients who are really struggling under this kind of dark who is on brand protection, on security and fraud investigations, and we just we need to get to some certainty soon. But it looks like it's going to take just a, just some more time, unfortunately. So that now brings us to EPDP phase two. So phase one implementation and EPDP phase two policy have been running concurrently. These are two separate groups. So um, phase two officially began in May, so that was when kind of the phase one policy was done. They felt like they could then start working on the phase two um, work, which is about sort of the mechanics, the access to this non-public data. And so the EPD, EPDP Phase Two team is really charged, um, kind of tasked with um, coming up with that, with what you know, we're, whatever has been kind of wanting to get to is a standardized access and disclosure model. You'll sometimes see the abbreviation SSAD to refer to that. Um, they did publish their initial report this February, um, and actually it's out for public comment. And that public comment period closes. Um, you know, as we're doing this webinar effectively on the on the, the 23rd, so just a day before. But um, the team has divided its work. So, you know, we talk about all these different work streams and kind of tracks. This EPDP Phase 2 policy team has kind of also divided its work into Priority 1 and Priority 2 topics. So Priority 1 really is focused on that that standardized access, central, centralized, you know, access um, data model, um, and, and kind of all the kind of questions related there too. You know, terms things like who should have, who should be making requests, how do you authenticate them, all those types of things. And I'll show you a little diagram here in a minute. But then priority two, kind of, if you will, kind of kicks to the curb a little bit, um, at least temporarily. Um, things like display of information of a affiliated versus accredited parties. So resellers versus, you know, um, accredited registrars, privacy proxy, um, legal name, legal versus natural persons. There's a lot of debate around the city field and the need to redact that. Um, you can kind of see all that's there. But this this phase one report um, I, the initial report really only includes the priority one um, items. So it doesn't include any of the priority two. They are working hard to try to make sure that priority two gets into the final. And I, quite honestly, I don't see how it can't. But um, nonetheless, there's just it's sort of like a you know again seems like everybody's just pushing, pushing, pushing to the deadline. But there may be some issues that prevent them from from hitting it. So let me, um, here's a, a nice um, kind of, I think, much cleaner visual representation of what is meant by this SSAD model. So in past webinars, again, for those of you who have been joining us, there's been this, you know, historically very messy diagram, um, very kind of um, hard to, quite honestly, hard to kind of follow um, diagram of how this all would work. But we've come now to this sort of um, visual representation, which I think is a much cleaner version. This is um, from one of the presentations at ICANN 67. And what you kind of see, um, if you start all the way to the left, is that you know somebody wants to request non-public who is data. So again, that contact information that's now redacted in the who is for everyone. Um, how, if there's a legitimate purpose, if you are trying to assert your trademark rights, your you know brand protection, take brand protection action, or there's some kind of security or fraud reason for law enforcement um, or others to kind of get to that non-public data, the, the the unfortunately the temporary specification kind of says, yeah, you can do it if you have a legitimate purpose. 
and that's not really in detail, really fully fleshed out. So we are kind of left in a little bit of limbo right now where there are parties making requests directly to registries and registrars trying to get that data. Um, there's no standardization on how to make those requests or the policies that any of those groups are, are following. Um, those groups, the registries and registrars, are somewhat challenged because sometimes um, people are asserting some very kind of um, different legal rights and showing different evidence related to those legal rights. And some of their staff are they're not attorneys, in fact, that are kind of processing these things. So it's it's created quite a um, problem. And quite honestly, um, many of the parties that are being contacted are favoring sort of non-disclosure over disclosure for fear of being sued under the GDPR. So this model, um, if you again look to the left, you have a requester. Um, there's going to be an authorization um, kind of authority, if you will, an accreditation authority that will then kind of check on the identity uh, of this requester. Um, there's been some discussions about maybe having um, kind of like pre-validated identities or people um, who can um, would kind of automatically get through this step. There's some discussion still remaining on that. But essentially, if we get to the point where yes, the requester is you know um, accredited to make the request, the request would then go in basically to ICANN or someone they could delegate to review the request. Um, and this is sort of the, the centralized, um, you know, gateway, if you will, where the request gets reviewed, and if it meets all the requirements, then it could either go down a manual process, which is kind of to the, if you could kind of look down, um, it can go through a manual process, uh, whereby the, the the contracted party, whether it be the registry or the registrar, then provides that information to the requester or it can go through an automated process where the contracted party's system would um, provide that information to the, um, the requester. This last part, I think, has been um, one of the hardest parts of this, is that who provides the data to the requester? Um, and there's been a lot of concerns about, is it really necessary for it to go back through to ICANN? Doesn't that expose? this sort of potentially, um, you know, personal data to additional people, additional systems, things like that. But um, this seems to have um, finally, I think, worked its way out where there's a um, recommendation that it has come through the, 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 the contracted party. So um, this is in that initial report that was issued in February that uh, public comment is closing on um, here um, uh, March 23rd, there'll then be a staff report that will summarize the public comments, and then those public comments will be taken into consideration before a final report is due. So that's something, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, we've been reading through and participating and following um, this process here, but um, it's really when that staff report comes out that um, I think we're going to have a very good idea of where things are going. And uh, we'll definitely, you know, either be blogging or, or sending out um, uh, a briefing document out on sort of what it looks like things are going to look like under this SSAD model. Um, but uh, definitely, we're getting to a point where we're going to have a little bit more clarity on the model, and there's still a lot to still figure out, though. So, in terms of next steps for this EPDP Phase Two group, you can kind of see there's, you know. That gray portion is kind of the time that has already elapsed, and the sort of the the wider version of the timeline is sort of the the time between um, this past ICANN meeting and the next ICANN meeting. You can see there's multiple streams of work going on here, very condensed. Um, so it's it's they're they're trying to run to the finish. Um, the ICANN fiscal year ends at the end of um, June. And there's some concern. Um, this group was supposed to take a year to complete its work. It's coming up on that year. Um, there's some concern that their funding may run out from ICANN, so that's why they are uh, kind of really trying to push it to the end here. Um, 
I, it'll be interesting to see if they make it. I, I think um, I know that many in the community feel that it's better to get this right than to do it fast. Um, we still want something done with some expediency, but if uh, I think if they needed a couple extra months to complete their work and do it with quality, um, I do think that that the funding will be um, extended. So we'll we'll have to watch that. All right, I think now take a deep breath. EPDP is over. I know that's a lot. Um, let's now switch <laughs> gears to um, the rights protection mechanisms um, policy development process. Um, no less weighty of a topic. It's just we're a little further along here, but um, still much work to do. But just to remind everybody, um, these next two um, policy development processes really were sort of on the back of the implementation kind of yeah the implementation of round one of the new GTLD program. So when ICANN um kind of got through delegation of most of the TLDs, um one of the things they had promised the governmental advisory committee very early on in the um round one of the new GTLD program is that they would take time to kind of like stop, reflect on round one think about what went right, what went wrong, take corrective action before implementing round two. Now, there's been um, some pressure um, to get to round two, um, but ICANN is kind of held to their word to the GAC that you know policy work needs to get done before um, that can happen. Now, I won't say that, you know, um, they've been so clear that implementation of that policy work has to be completed before round two, but um, I do expect um, that kind of comes up. I do expect that um, there will be a fair amount of policy work that gets implemented. Um, I would say most of the, the policy work will get implemented before we see round two. But um, round two is still, the date is still in question. Um, my estimation is it is a good two years off at the least. Um, but let's dig into where they are right now. Two PDPs. Um, one is related to rights protection mechanisms, and then the second you'll see is regarding subsequent procedures. So let's tackle rights protection mechanisms. Um, this PDP is being conducted in two phases. That sounds familiar. Um, phase one covers all the rights protection mechanisms that were launched um, as part of the new GTLD program in, in 2012. And then phase two is a review of the UDRP, um, Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy. And that's really been a rights protection mechanism that, that, that's been in place in the GTLD space, the generic top-level domain space, um, since 1999, and quite honestly has served the community very well. But they want to do kind of a relook at it in light of these new GTLDs and see if there's anything there that needs to be tweaked, so that will be phase two. All right, so in terms of where the um, RPM PDP is, um, they've recently revisited the initial review of the Uniform Rapid Suspension System, the URS. That's kind of that, I'll call it that short form um, uh, administrative uh, process. You know, it's not quite a UDRP, but it enables a, um, complainant to have the name taken down out of the um, DNS and it would kind of stay in abeyance for at least the remainder of its registration period. Um, but the complainant doesn't recover the domain name. So that's why it's sort of sort of a lighter version, if you will, of UDRP. But back in December, so after ICANN 66, um, the sub the the kind of the the, the team that that was tasked, the, the sub team that was tasked um, on recommendations, they uh, completed and um, completed their work there. Then, in mid-December through January, they put together some uh, more specific support levels for kind of some individual proposals. Tried to clean some things up. Uh, let's just say there's just a lot going on in this RPM, and I think um, there's been a little bit. I think in some ways it got too complicated, but then too vague at the same time. So anyway, um, they've come to the conclusion that they need more time. Um, and so in late January, um, you know, they basically completed their review of, and this was through the um, ICANN 
67 meeting. They completed their review of the draft initial report and comments. Um, they, they, sorry, then they published the, the report um, for public comment. That's open through April 27th, so um, that's available on the ICANN website. Um, then they expect that they're going to need May through September to review those comments. And then somewhere in the mid to uh, mid September to mid October, they think they can get to publishing the final report. They need more time. It's the bottom line, um, and there are reasons for that. And we'll review that in just a second. So while when we reviewed the EPDP, we saw just like the the uh, quantity and intensity of the substantive work that that needed. To get done, I think this um, RPM has kind of suffer, suffered from some different challenges in terms that uh, that requ that's going to require an extension of, of deadline. And so, just at a high level, like I mentioned, the charter questions—they're um, broad, they're unclear, um, hard to kind of come up with a specific answer and recommendation for. Um, there's a very diverse group on this RPM, also. And they're all digging their heels in. Uh, data quality is an issue. There's limited scope of data. So really trying to kind of find the learnings from that data and kind of balance the policy interest has been a struggle. Um, issues, just when you think they're to bed, they come back up again. And then also just time management. I, you know, I think it's it's hard. I mean, in fairness, the, these, group, these groups are, these working groups are really intense. These folks meet. Um, you know, at least weekly, several times a week, often lots of communications in between, lots of document drafting. Um, there's just, you know, and, and often, you know, this is work they're doing in addition to their other jobs. So, you know, they're they're working as volunteers as part of these groups, and it's really hard to manage all the demands and the time, and especially when there's sort of like this relitigation going on and trying to kind of focus everybody. It's been a real challenge with this working group really um, throughout, and I think um, they're getting there, but they're they're inching there slowly at this point. So, um, you know, more, more work to do and more time needed. So let's now turn to the new GTLD subsequent procedures PDP. I know that's kind of a cryptic title for that one, and what you should do is just think about this one as so there was the applicant guidebook. It was sort of the, the policies and procedures and processes for um, round one of the new GTLD program. Everything from um, you know who can apply to how do you apply and then how does the application get processed. So all those procedures. Um, this PDP was really about looking at um, things that you know upon reflection probably needed um, you know we kind of needed to be looked at. And so they broke it into five work tracks. Again, a common theme within the ICANN PDP process to kind of break things down into what they either call phases or work streams or work tracks. Um, but um, work track one was about the overall process support and outreach. Work track two is about the legal, regulatory, and contractual obligations. Work track three, the string contention and objection disputes, which um, I think a lot of challenges there. Work track four, the internationalized domain names and the technical and operational issues. And then work track five, geographic names. So geo names often um, is what it's called. So a lot um, really being looked at uh, across this PDP. So where are they? So um, I think before there was an expectation there would be another limited public comment period. Um, for this PDP, but um, the, the expectation for all, all the recommendations to be available um, really significantly impacts the timeline. So they've also asked for a project change request to, to the GNSO Council. Um, the list of topics identified um, is extensive, as I mentioned, and um, you know, they're trying to develop these final recommendations, but there's still some of those very challenging topics that still have some pending deliberations. Again, not only within the work group, but without, with the outside ICANN community. So things like closed generics, you'll see in a minute, that's a, that's a topic of concern for the GAC. Uh, predictability framework, 
string contention and resolution. So there's still some pretty meaty topics that need some additional work. Um, there's also some digging in here, and then there's also, I think, a recognition or sort of a realization, if you will, at this point, that this team may complete its work, and there may be a few topics where the work group aren't able to come to consensus. And that's challenging in the in the ICANN world because it is a consensus policy organization. So um, there's a lot of unknowns when you can't come to consensus. So what are we talking about in terms of timing? Um, I think you know this is assuming that they get more time, that the work change is approved. Um, but they're going to try you know hard to to really get this done before the end of this year. Um, if I were a betting person, I'm going to say it's going to slide into Q1 of 2021, but we're going to have to see. But um, you know, this work group has done a tremendous amount of work. Um, again, volunteers spending an enormous amount of time. So it's really not meant to be a knock on them. It's just this process is grueling, and um, it takes time. It takes collaboration. It takes cooperation. Um, and these these issues are not often ones that can be merely de debated from within. They need to get outside inputs. So, um, more, you know, more work here needed as well, but we'll continue to follow it for you. All right. Now, with all those PDPs behind us, let's turn our attention to another hot topic. This actually took, um, they dedicated the whole first um, public forum to the org registry acquisition. So let me just bring some folks up to speed if you haven't um, been following this closely. So in November, um, a, a equity firm, um, Ethos Capital, announced the acquisition of Public Interest Registry, which is the .org registry, um, for $1.13 billion. Now, um, I think what really got folks about this was a number of things. But one, one kind of interesting fact is that one of the partners at Ethos Capital was the former CEO and president of ICANN, Fadi Chahadi. So that raised some eyebrows. Um, and then you had um, many in the ICANN community really concerned about um, price escalation. So, you know, the .dot org TLD is one where it, it's used very widely by you know nonprofits. Um, non-governmental organizations, so NGOs, um, you know, folks and organizations that typically don't have a lot of cash. And while there is no like strict um, eligibility criteria that that's the only kind of companies or individuals that should be using the org TLD, it just has been um, since kind of the beginning. Um, and so earlier last year. Uh, as .org was going through its very typical contract renewal with ICANN, um, the registry's contracts come up for renewal, um, and they they get reviewed. Um, some of the legacy GTLD contracts, so ComNet, org, I think those InfoBiz, those those ones that existed before the new GTLD program, those. TLDs um, have been having any kind of price caps kind of removed from them. Um, dot com still there, but they have a lot more wiggle room than they used to. But some of these other smaller TLDs um, that are obviously have many millions less uh, names and market power than dot com, they um, have been having their price caps kind of removed because the new GTLD contracts for those new registries didn't have price caps because ICANN kind of um, came to the conclusion that they should not be getting involved in issues around price, um, that they're not a regulator, that they're a policy organization, and therefore they should get out of that business. Um, well, this has caused you know, the combination of this acquisition plus sort of this change in the kind of price caps within the org contract has given the nonprofit and NGO community very significant pause about this acquisition. They're very concerned about significant price escalation and how it may cause kind of hardship for them in terms of having a web presence. So ICANN has been sort of pressured by the community 
uh, um, to not approve the, the transfer of PIR, which is Public Interest Registry, to, to Ethos Capital. Um, those calls have predominantly come from you know, nonprofits, NGOs, um, internet users, that type of thing. Um, and ICANN is kind of like dip its toe in, dip its toe out, dip its toe in, dip its toe out. Well, right now, it, like the they're basically being asked, you know, don't approve this transfer. Um, they have decided that the transaction's on hold for right now. And they were supposed to make a decision earlier, but quite honestly, with um, the coronavirus and like, I think delays and challenges related to that, they've been able to push out a decision to um, April 20th. In the interim, um, the Governmental Advisory um, Committee as well as the United States Senate have expressed serious concerns around this. You know, again, the price issue, um, issues around transparency. Um, the Public Interest Registry actually used to be owned by the um, Internet Society, um, so it's called the ISOC. And this was sort of, you know, also a, you know, kind of public benefit corporation. It was one where actually the the proceeds for .org was helping fund a lot of their activities. And so this has given a lot of people great pause. Um, the transparency around this has given people a lot of concern. The price issues has given concerns. Um, what public interest commitments, um, the public interest commitments that Ethos has proposed or concerning. So there's a lot of um, a lot of people kind of bearing down on ICANN right now around this transaction. All I can say is what a mess. What a mess. Um, but it is, uh, it is something that's a hot topic right now, so I want to make sure to get you up to speed on that. Um, we'll certainly see things unfold over the next few weeks, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. And then finally, and finally, no, um, I can uh, summary webinar would be complete if we didn't talk about sort of the GAC communique. So again, for those of you who've joined us on these, this webinar series before, at the end of every I can meeting, the GAC issues what they call their communique, and this really gives a kind of a recap of their activities during the meeting, and then also provides ish, um, kind of advice to the I can board. This is kind of the formal mechanism. They often use to transmit advice to the ICANN board. And so it's always important to look at what those issues are that they raise in their communique um, to kind of track where things are going um, and what might not move as fast as one might have thought before, as well as um, kind of maybe get heads up on some oncoming issues. So um, the org transition or the org registry transaction is definitely one. Um, you know, as I mentioned, they're very, very concerned about this. Their advice to the ICANN board is really, um, you know, here are our concerns. And by the way, make sure you're considering community input very thoughtfully in your decision making. So um, that is code for we are watching you. Um, so let's see what, what happens here. Uh, it's not like the GAC in itself can do anything, but um, they can, they, you know, when they give the ICANN board advice, um, it then gets put into this kind of tracker, and the ICANN board needs to respond. And it needs to respond with, we agree with you, we don't agree with you, um, or we think this needs to be changed. Um, the, the latter two kind of invoke some um, additional processes um, specifically, specifically the one we don't agree with you or we are disagreeing with your recommendation. Um, that one requires a very formal bylaws process um, with the board. So uh, we'll watch this space. It's, it's going to be interesting. They also have concerns, um, continue to have concerns around new GTLD subsequent procedures. And quite honestly, the GAC has been very, very vocal um, throughout the ICANN um, new GTLD program, and therefore one of the reasons why I can promise the GAC that it would um, go through these PDPs before going to round two. Um, the GAC is following these PDPs closely. They are even engaging in trying to help, um, you know, engage where they can and when they can. Uh, it's a tremendous time commitment 
but um, they have been um, in the last year or so actually trying to engage earlier in the policy process than waiting to the end and then giving advice, which I think has been really constructive and helpful. Um, but some of the issues around new GTLD subsequent procedures, they're still very concerned about the closed generics issue. Um, and what that is is um, there were some companies who, when they applied for a TLD, they didn't just apply for brands. They also applied for what's considered like category words, like books or music or things like that, and wanted to operate them as closed TLDs just for their benefit. Um, so that has been an issue that has, you know, had a lot of twists and turns through um, the new GTLD program and, and continues to be the case through this policy development process um, post round one. So still a lot of concerns around closed generics. Public interest commitments are things that registries can, um, can and must, um, I should say not can, must, um, kind of commit to um, as part of their kind of registry operations. And a lot of the, the GAC's concerns earlier in the new GTLD program and even more so today is around DNS abuse. Um, they do not think that there are strong enough public interest commitments by many TLDs, especially ones that uh, um, are targeted towards highly regu regulated industries or particular populations. Um, they are very concerned that these public interest commitments are not strong enough, they're not detailed enough, they're not, um, they're not um, aggressively enforced. Um, so there's a lot of concerns, and again, a lot of this um, relates to DNS abuse. So I expect to be a lot more conversation on this um, in, in the coming, coming year. Um, the GAC Early Warning and GAC Advice, um, they have a process within the new GTLD program currently where um, when the list of names was first published from round one, the GAC had sort of a, almost like a, we would call it a first swing at sort of raising concerns about um, TLDs that were applied for and um, they would publish those concerns and then applicants had a chance to kind of engage with those GAC members that um, raise concerns or those, those countries that raise concerns um, and or withdraw and get um, a kind of an 80% an refund. The GAC advice part is you know, also part of that. Um, they want that process tightened up. It, the, the, one of the big issues was they didn't have enough time. Um, it took a, a, definitely there were a lot of applications that didn't have a lot of time to respond, and then it was a bumpy process after that. Um, they, they want it to be clearer. Um, they want more support for applicants, particularly ones from emerging um, you know, economies where uh, maybe English is not the first language um, in places that um, technology or the Internet are not widely available. They want more support for applicants in those kind of categories to be able to facilitate them coming online and you know, applying for a TLD. Remember, you can only apply for a TLD as an entity. It's not like an individual can apply for a TLD. And then lastly, community applications. These are applications that are designated to be for members of a certain community. So um, you saw like, um, I think a good one is like .bank and .insurance. Um, that is for the financial institution community. Um, you saw dot realtor. That was for the you know community of people who are realtors, um, things like that. So you can see um, they think those those applications are important. They think that the price tag and the kind of um, yeah price tag and the complexity of the process really don't um, uh, sway in favor of community applicants. It makes it really really tough for them almost puts them at a disadvantage. So there's concerns there, and the, the GAC has expressed those concerns throughout as well. And then in terms of um, kind of current process, the EPDP, um, I can, you know, they continue to urge I can to create and implement a standardized form um, for, for people to request non-public data for legitimate purpose during this interim period. I think they've become more understanding that, you know, they've been for a long time kind of pushing and saying, 
you know, you've got to get the process up and running. You've got to get this EPDP completed and implemented. We've got to get off the temporary specification. This needs to be done now, 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 now. I think they've kind of kind of throttled that back a bit in this last meeting. I think I definitely heard a change in tone. And understanding that there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed and should be addressed, and so they want to allow time for that. But they have been urging ICANN all along and are really ramping up the kind of discourse on this where ICANN, they really feel, needs to lead here and work to create and implement a standardized form to request a non to request that non-public data for legitimate purpose while we're in this interim period so that brand protection interests, law enforcement, security investigators, et cetera, can get what they need and that it's a defined process, that everyone has to follow it, that there's no ambiguity, but all that exists right now and ICANN continues to assert that um, it's not their place to kind of put this um, this together, this needs to come up through the GNSO. So this is a little bit of a wrestling match, this issue, but this is something that GAC is really um, starting to um, get more, get kind of more vocal about. And I, I expect that in the next three to three to six months, this is going to be um, a topic that is going to be at the fore. So um, we'll be interesting to see where we land. So of course, there's a lot more that goes on during an ICANN meeting, but these are some of the key highlights that I think um, kind of give you the essence um, in terms of things that you'll want to, to keep uh, keep apprised of. So thanks for your time.